Good afternoon. Invited guests, friends, and colleagues. <clears throat> One of the courses that I teach at BYU is called Portuguese Civilization. About 10 years ago, Martin Page published a marvelous book, which I now use as one of my texts, his title, the first, Portugal, The First Global Village, How Portugal Changed the World. Uh, that title suggests, in a nutshell, the incredible legacy that Portugal has given to us. So it is indeed my pleasure to introduce today's guest, His Excellency Nuno Brito, the Ambassador of Portugal to the United States, and uh, his delightful wife, Rita, uh, uh, Rosa Brito. Um, <clears throat> the ambassador has been in the United States uh, in this call in his post for two years. He has been the political director of Portugal and co-chair of the Portuguese U.S. Standing Bilateral Committee since 2008. A lawyer by education, he began his career as a Portuguese diplomat in 1984, posted to the Portuguese embassy in Washington, D.C. in 1987, and he served there for the next six years. In 1997, Ambassador Brito was posted to the Portuguese mission in the United, to the United Nations, where he was active for a number of years. Subsequently, he returned to Portugal, where he has, was senior diplomatic advisor to the prime minister. He was then appointed director general for European affairs and co-chair of the Luso Spanish Transborder Cooperation Commission. E sabemos lá nem bom vento nem mau casamento. So the ambassador is quite familiar with Portugal's grand global village, which has included important dialogues with the U.S. since the 18th century. We look forward to his talk now, a Portuguese perspective on Europe and the world, from Lisbon to Macau, from Boston to Brazil. Desde Rui, desde, desde Nuno Alvarez Pereira a Nuno Brito. Mr. Ambassador. Good morning. Uh, bom dia. I don't know how many of, of you speak Portuguese. But first of all, let me thank you, uh, Professor Land uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Corey, uh, for introducing me. And also thanking um, Helder uh, Hinckley and uh, Dr. Peterson for uh, also inviting me to come uh, today to, to this university. Um, I, I had prepared a speech in Portuguese, and the being in Portuguese, it would be an, uh, uh, a two-hour speech, but I de I've decided to, to, to shorten it, and uh, so I will tell you something about, about my country, and I expect that you uh, ask me a lot, lots of questions about what I'm going to say. But, uh, Let me start by, by stating the obvious. I mean, to a large extent, I think it was Napoleon, uh, and it's my, the first and last time in my life that I'm going to quote Napoleon. Uh, <laughs> he said that uh, geography is destiny. And if you look at the map, if you look at Portugal, you see that we are at, obviously at the center of the world, uh, uh, in that part of the world. Uh, but Uh, the fact that we, we are where we are explains a lot about uh, how we were born and, uh, and what kind of country we are uh, currently. I mean, Portugal was born in the 12th century, in 1143, uh, uh, so it was a long, long time ago in a far distant galaxy. But uh, uh, we had our own Star Wars, we moved on. Uh, we started to expand uh, abroad in the 14th century. Uh, that it was, uh, the reasons for that were twofold. I mean, uh, on one hand, of course, we wanted to have more trade, more economic opportunities. On the other hand, we wanted to expand, uh, in those days, uh, our Christian faith. And we, we moved around. I mean, we were uh, the first country to, 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 to go to China and Japan 
Um, and as a, matter, as a matter of fact, uh, in, for those who will travel to Boston uh, soon, there is a very nice exhibition about the, the Jesuit Portugal in Japan at Macmillan College uh, that was inaugurated last week. So, and we went to India, of course, and to Africa, and to South America. We skipped northern part of America uh, because we wanted to give uh, uh, Columbus something to, to brag about. Uh, <laughs> he tried, actually. He lived in Madeira uh, for a while, and we were not smart enough at that point to, to grab him. But uh, when we talk about, uh, in a more, on a more serious basis, about what Portugal is, you have to understand where we come from. I mean, we are, we are an old country, but we are not frozen in history. Uh, we are a very modern country, um, also uh, a young democracy, but a very stable one. And we are trying to, co to cope with a globalized world, the same kind of world that uh, we had to cope with uh, when we started uh, our adventure overseas. So if you ask me, what are your priorities as a Portuguese ambassador, I mean, from a foreign policy uh, point of view? Well, first of all, we, we are Europeans. That means that we are part of the European family. That means that we are deeply committed to the European Union integration process. We are uh, the avant-garde, I mean, uh, in, of all integration processes uh, going on in the European Union. Uh, be it uh, the freedom of circulation of people, what we call Schengen, and for those who study European affairs, you know what that means. Be it uh, um, on the at the currency level, and I can expand on that, uh, the, the Eurozone, we are a, a founding member as well. Uh, so we have also a very close relationship with all the treaties that have been negotiated. For instance, the last treaty uh, that binds the European Union together, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, was uh, negotiated during the, por the rotating Portuguese presidency of the European Council of the Union in 2007. And uh, we are also uh, uh, very close to the European institutions on a daily life. Uh, the president of the European Commission, Mr. Barroso, a former prime minister of Portugal, uh, is a Portuguese citizen. The vice president of the European Central Bank, for instance, are Portuguese citizens. So if you look at, at us, you see uh, uh, us fully committed um, in uh, the European project. We feel that this is probably in the history of, of Europe, the best achievement that we have got so far. Because for the first time, we have a family of nations sitting together uh, at a table, discuss the, uh, solving their problems uh, through negotiation and not by war. And that's in itself, if you look at the history of Europe, uh, a remarkable achievement. And of course, we are much more than that. But we are not a federal state. And we have problems uh, that federal states do not have or do not face. Um, and uh, I will revisit those problems later on we'll, when we talk about the economic situation uh, of Europe. The second leg of our foreign policy uh, has to do <coughs> what we call our Atlantic, Atlantic approach. Uh, we are what we, uh, some people say Atlanticists. What does it mean? <coughs> it means that we, we see the Atlantic as our common House. <coughs> we look at the United States of America, and uh, we, uh, as a matter of fact, Portugal was the second country to have recognized the independence of the United States of, Amer of America after the Netherlands. So, and I was uh, pleased last weekend, I was invited to go to Mount Vernon to celebrate the 281 years of the President Washington. And President Washington uh, was there and, uh, for his birthday and addressed to me saying that, well, I just regret that we are toasting my uh, birthday today with champagne and not with Madeira wine, because <laughs> your independence, I, don't, I, don't, I know that uh, uh, you don't drink usually, but your ind independence uh, was, was toasted with uh, Madeira wine. Uh, your, uh, um, uh, also the, uh, George Washington's inauguration also with the same kind of wine, and the first stone of the capital with the same wine. So, uh, I'm not uh, proselytizing uh, here today, but I'm just uh, reminding uh, the, the, that uh, that was an important uh, uh, tie with the U.S. But taking that aside, I mean, we have a very strong relationship with the United States. We have 1.4 million 
people in this country, according to your own census, who say that uh, they are either Portuguese or Portuguese Americans. Three of uh, the members of the uh, US uh, House of Representatives are Portuguese Americans born in California. One uh, federal senator uh, is a Portuguese American from Pennsylvania. Uh, at local level, we have many elected, uh, locally elected people, uh, especially in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, also in New Jersey, California, uh, Hawaii, and increasingly in, in, um, in Florida uh, also. So not uh, in Utah for the time being, but uh, I've just learned that uh, at this university, uh, uh, more than a thousand students know uh, something about Portugal and the Portuguese language. So I'm, I'm quite confident that at some point, even in Utah, there will be a strong connection with Portugal. <laughs> Uh, stronger than the one that already exists. So the United States are important for us uh, in, in that sense. I mean, we have a defense and cooperation uh, agreement with the US that uh, goes back to the 50s. We are a founding member of NATO uh, and uh, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The last summit was in Chicago, the, the one before it was in Lisbon. And we have been uh, uh, also, uh, talking about the Atlantic uh, as our common house, not only because of the US, uh, but also because of Brazil, uh, which is uh, the largest Portuguese-speaking country in the world, and, and also an emerging power, and a peaceful one, I may, I may add. Um, and if you look across the ocean, uh, you look at Angola, my, my second home. I was uh, born there and grew up there. You look in the other coast to Mozambique, or Guinea-Bissau, or Cape Verde, or Santo Tomé, and they are uh, countries, Portuguese-speaking countries. Far to the east, you look at the East Timor, near Australia and Indonesia, which is also a Portuguese-speaking uh, country. So these are important relationships, uh, relationships for us. And the, the language is fast becoming, the Portuguese language, uh, an important tool for international business. Uh, and I think that it's something that, that is, uh, is, is also part of our foreign policy. I would say that uh, these are the main pillars of our foreign policy. I, uh, there is a third leg. If you look at the map, and Lisbon, and Rabat, and Lisbon, uh, and Madrid, uh, if you fly, uh, it's slightly, uh, the distance is slightly less between Lisbon and Rabat than, than between Lisbon and Madrid. And so uh, uh, everything that goes on in the Middle East and Northern Africa is a matter uh, that we follow uh, with great interest and concern sometimes. Uh, why? Because the Middle East literally starts at our doorstep uh, from a geographic point of view. Now, let's talk a, lot, a little bit about, about Europe. Uh, I mean, since the financial crisis started in the last one, in, in 2008, uh, it was clear uh, that uh, um, in Europe we were facing a, a situation that we had not experienced before. In the old days, if a country would, would, uh, would face uh, uh, an economic problem uh, based in an, uh, an, an imbalance in its um, external accounts, for instance, Basically, the, that country would have to develop the, the currency, its currency, and, uh, and uh, move on with other measures. So things would, would become easier to deal with. But we are now part of what uh, some call the Eurozone, uh, or the Euro area, if you want. It's a common currency, and we are reinforcing this currency and the pillars of this cur currency uh, in the middle of a financial storm. That's not an easy task. It's not only a, a Portuguese problem, so to speak. Uh, it's a European uh, problem. And we have been dealing with it through uh, the European institutions. And uh, we have reached a number of agreements, like the fiscal compact, uh, that uh, we believe, in the end, will enable us to move on to a next phase and to, to leave this uh, current um, financial uh, situation that, uh, uh, with which we are dealing with. Portugal was, was hard hit by the crisis. And as a result, uh, about uh, 20 months ago, we uh, uh, decided to have, uh, alongside with the, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and 
the, international, the IMF, what we call uh, an adjustment economic program. And uh, this program basically has been working in three fronts. I mean, on one hand, we have to, we have to ensure fiscal consolidation. And I have to tell you that uh, in two years' time, almost, we have been able to bring our deficit from a GDP point of view from about more than 9% to 5% uh, of the GDP. I think it's an amazing um, achievement. And we are committed to bring it down to below 3% um, until uh, 2014. Of course, as we speak, uh, uh, we are reviewing our program with uh, uh, our lenders. And we may have to uh, uh, adjust parts of the program, but that's only normal. Uh, so I don't want to prejudge in which direction we are moving on. But the fact, the, the fact is that fiscal consolidation has, has taken place. We have been able to slash 17 billion euro in our primary expenditure. It's a lot of money in, in, in a very short period of time. And the price that we had to pay for it, of course, was uh, clear. I mean, we, we knew that we would have uh, negative growth this year and uh, an increase in, in the unemployment rate. And that uh, our top priority now for us, after dealing with this fiscal consolidation and also with banking the leverage, because uh, we also had to deal with that, uh, the question now is, how are we going to grow? How, how, how can we ensure economic growth in the future? And for that, I mean, we have a program of uh, reform, uh, reforms in place that go from reforming our rental market to uh, privatizing state-owned uh, corporations. Uh, for instance, the biggest uh, electric um, uh, utility company uh, in Portugal was fu fully privatized last, last year. The airports of Portugal were f uh, also fully uh, privatized. Our main airline uh, is probably the next uh, target for that. And we are doing this because we want to decrease the weight of the state in the economy and to ensure that in the future we will not face a situation similar to the one that we have been facing uh, at, uh, until this moment. I must say that the Portuguese people has been reacting to this hardship situation in a very uh, encouraging and brave way. Because, of course, we have a very lively political uh, debate and dialogue. Uh, you can see demonstrations. You can see a number of things that are quite uh, usual in, the, in democracy. But uh, um, everything is taking place in a peaceful and or orderly way, as it should be. And so uh, I hope that we, we still move in, in, in that direction. There is a big debate now in Portugal about how to proceed. And uh, uh, if I would be uh, invited by uh, your university in a couple of months to come back, I would brief you about the outcome of that debate. But I'm, I feel encouraged with the preliminary results in any, in any event. But for Europe, I mean, for Portugal, uh, we cannot solve the problem by ourselves because we are part of a zone, the Eurozone. And so, as I said, there is a more systemic approach that needs to be taken in Europe, and we have been taking some steps uh, to redress the imbalances there. Now, we, you can argue, well, you have been too austere. Well, we, we say there is no uh, uh, difference between... Uh, uh, fiscal consolidation and growth. We need fiscal consolidation in order to ensure a proper um, uh, basis for, for the economy to grow in a sustainable way and to build a more equitable society. That's what we want to do. Um, so we can, you can say, well, you have not been operating fast enough. That's uh, in the United States when you look at Europe. I would try to say, well, maybe yes, but the fact is that uh, we are not a federal state like you are. And, uh, and so we have 27, 28 with Croatia, uh, member states. Uh, and uh, all of them are, uh, have accountability from a democratic point of view. And so we have an, an election going on every other week in Europe and the people talking about it. Of course, we, in Europe, we have s some countries that are more equal than others. But uh, uh, given their uh, demographic projection or economic power, but that's only natural. 
one of the interesting ideas that came up came out uh, from Europe and the United States is the is building this uh, new uh, transatlantic uh, free trade agreement, free trade and investment uh, agreement. As you know, President Obama just announced, alongside with the President of the European Commission and the President of the European Council, that uh, we will, will be uh, negotiating this kind of, of agreement, Europe and the United States. And it makes a lot of sense because uh, not only we, we are the two largest trading partners in the world, uh, but also uh, from an investment point of view, it will, would enable more investment to flow in both directions. It means a lot in terms of job creation in the United States and in, U in Europe as well. Uh, it would uh, enable our corporations to modernize themselves and their operations in a faster way. And more important than, than that, it would put both sides of the Atlantic in a much, much better footing to deal uh, with other parts of the world in issues of common interest, like uh, copyrights, uh, protecting copyrights, or uh, ensuring um, 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 commonalities uh, in, in the way we, we assemble products and, and sell them. And so this is this trade agreement, uh, of course, uh, it will take its time to be negotiated. We, we, we expect it will be f rather sooner than later. Uh, but it's, it's going to be very important for both parties of, uh, of the Atlantic. Now, how do we face crisis situations also? Because we are not, uh, by doing this, we are in a way complementing NATO. With NATO, uh, we have uh, a common alliance. With the trade agreement, I think that we will have a common trade space, which is uh, uh, also very important. Of course, for a country like Portugal, geography is destiny. I'm not going to, to, to quote again uh, who said that. Uh, but uh, not entirely, not entirely. As uh, Professor Land said, uh, we were the first global village. Uh, the past is the past. But the fact is that we, we still keep very strong ties with uh, China, with Japan, with uh, India, with, uh, with Africa. And uh, we are, uh, for instance, one of the things that we, we have seen during this crisis is that we are exporting more to out of the European Union, uh, diversifying our exports uh, in our markets. Uh, and, um, and that means that we have the, the ability to do that uh, still. And uh, that's a very important point, because for the first time in our recent history, uh, in 2012, we, uh, we were able to sell more than we, we bought from the outside world. So we have a, a, a balance, a trade balance, which is quite, as a matter of fact, balanced uh, for the first time in years. And that's uh, very important for a country uh, like Portugal. I mean, the exports uh, uh, are driving our economy, and that's uh, how it should be uh, in the end. In two minutes, because I, I would like to, to listen to, to, to your questions, uh, I would also uh, say that we pay uh, close attention to uh, what we call um, global issues. Uh, by that, we mean that we are very strong in, for instance, defending and protecting human rights uh, globally, and the freedom of religion is one of the basic human rights, uh, as you know. Uh, Portugal is a, a candidate country to the Human Rights Council, uh, uh, that sits in, 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 in Geneva. From a United Nations perspective, we have been trying to, uh, to do our best to uh, interact with the United Nations and to, and to assist the United Nations because we are the United Nations, all of us. So the Portuguese troops have been present in a number of, of the United Nations operations all around the world. We still have troops in, in Afghanistan. We're uh, fighting alongside uh, the American forces. And also uh, troops in places like Kosovo uh, in Europe, uh, uh, stabil uh, helping to stabilize uh, that region. We are, as a country also, we are very strongly in favor of uh, the um, uh, enlargement of the European Union. Because one of the things that you, you when you look at Europe at this point, one of the things that you, you hear is that, oh, it's a mess. I mean, uh, they are uh, on the verge of uh, 
disintegrating. I don't agree with that. I think that that's sounder to be more optimistic about Europe, not only because we are doing our uh, homework, but also as an indicator, I will tell you, there are a number of countries wanting to, to join us. Why? Uh, because our project is an, is an appealing project. I mean, from a democratic point of view, from a political point of view, from an economic point of view, in a very sound one. And so there are a number of candidate countries uh, still, to, uh, including Turkey, for instance, who want to join us. And uh, of course, we will welcome these moves uh, as well, because we, f we feel that in the end, they will reinforce Europe. Otherwise, uh, I think that Portugal looks very closely to issues like avoiding the pro proliferation of uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And we have been supporting the so-called five plus one uh, process of dialogue with Iran uh, to, uh, on, on this issue. Um, we are also uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, development uh, assistance uh, to the countries that, uh, that need it. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a Portuguese citizen who is the Human Rights High Commissioner for Refugees at this point, uh, Mr. Guterres, another uh, former Prime Minister. And we tend to support projects that bring the humanity together. And uh, like the Alliance of S Civilizations, uh, for instance. Um, um, and so th this is what we are. I mean, we try to project ourselves as a, a peaceful country with principles, part uh, of a very in, embedded in a very strong system of alliances, alliances with uh, other European countries, with the United States, with the Portuguese-speaking countries in the, in, in the world, and the country that wants not only to, to, to get something from the world, but also to give something to, to, to back to the world. Uh, because we, when we talk about the globalization, we think that there is something missing sometimes, which is the, the notion that we have to be globally responsible in the way we manage our planet. Well, thank you. That's what I wanted to tell you, for starters. <laughs> and now, now you can shoot me, so. So we have a roving microphone because we are broadcasting live. We'd ask that you just wait until the mic comes to you and tell us your name, where you're from, and what you're studying so we can get to know you a little bit better. We just have actually a few minutes now for questions, so. First question is always scary. Well, special for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, as you guys have... Tell, tell us your name. My name is James Johansson. I'm an economics major. I speak... Eu falo português. <laughs> okay. I will, um, I will reply in Portuguese then. <laughs> <laughs> Beleza. Um, my question is, that as you as Portugal's seen a lot of privatization right now, would you say that um, kind of beforehand, before all this privatization of kind of a larger government, was that kind of the lead role in Portugal's instability during this financial crisis? Well, thank you very much. No, not really. It's a very good question, but I mean, uh, uh, the as I said, we want to privatize not only to get cash, because in some cases it's, it's not even the case. We want to privatize because we believe that in some sectors of the economy, uh, the state should not be there, I mean, uh, running the show, basically. And uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, the private sector uh, can do that, uh, that can do be th that better than the state. And so uh, you have to understand that in 1974, we moved from uh, an authoritarian regime to a democracy. Uh, during that process, uh, some uh, corporations in Portugal were uh, nationalized because we also had an economic crisis as, as a result of decolonization and uh, a number of factors that uh, happened in Portugal. And uh, so we were still, uh, as we move on, we are still uh, dealing with, with the last effects of that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that time. Uh, for instance, I talked about EDP the company that was privatized, the largest one, uh, electric, uh, electricity utility in, 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 in Portugal. But only 20% belonged to the state, 
because uh, 80% had already been privati uh, privatized before. And so it made sense to us from a financial point of view, from an operational point of view, uh, and from the, point, the, the way we look at how the economy should, should be ruled uh, in the future to privatize that company. But we did that in a very transparent way. We got offers. Uh, we didn't want to just uh, a, a free for a free. Um, how can I put it? A free for all price. That was not the case. I mean, it was a very uh, uh, hard operation, uh, run by uh, in a transparent way according to international standards, and we got offers from Germany, from China, from India, from Japan, from Brazil. Uh, and in the end, the best offer was the one that uh, that uh, that won. So, um, what drives us is 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 much more complex than uh, what is at stake during this uh, financial situation. Uh, but of course, I mean the privatizations uh, are important, but uh, the results of it uh, will not be known for uh, for years to come. I mean, in a way. Uh, they are important in, in another sense. We want to go back to the markets. So we want to terminate at some point, as scheduled, uh, this program that we have with the, with the Troika, the adjustment program. And uh, in order to go back to the markets, uh, and we have been testing the, wa the waters recently with success, uh, we need to gain the, the regain the confidence of the markets. And this is a way of doing it. Uh, there are others, of course, and I, I've referred to fiscal consolidation. And talking about uh, corporations, let me seize the opportunity to say that we Portuguese also are very much present in the United States of America, our corporations. For instance, this one, EDP, uh, is, it, it is the third largest wind power company in the United States of America, based in, in, in Houston, Texas. Uh, we have also large operations from FASEC, uh, which uh, uh, manufactures transformers in Savannah, Georgia. We have uh, in the banking sector, uh, in the food sector, uh, I mean, increasingly a presence in the United States. Our trade has been growing uh, with, with the U.S., and so we expect to, to be able to attract more investment also from the U.S. to Portugal in, in the years to come. So I hope that I addressed your question. Hello, my name is Scott James, and também falo português. Um, okay. I just you mentioned a while ago, over the last 20 months, how Portugal has been improving in, <coughs> in that aspect. I was just wondering on right now, what is the situation of unemployment in Portugal? That's uh, our the th thank you for that question. I think because that's our uh, if I would to list a number of concerns, uh, that would be top in in my in my list. Why? In order to operate this kind of fiscal consolidation that we needed, and I have to say, fiscal consolidation was a no-brainer. I mean, we had to do it. It, it was not uh, an imposition. Uh, because the imbalances, uh, imbalance in our, uh, in our um, uh, financial accounts was, was, uh, was big. So in order to, to correct this and uh, to put us in a, a very sure uh, foothold, uh, of course, w we had to uh, uh, allow less money to, to be invested from the state. And the weight of the state in the economy was big, I mean, in, in Portugal still is, uh, although it has decreased. And our target is to, to place it at no more than 42% from a GDP point of view, 42% uh, uh, of, of the Portuguese economy. So we, uh, as a result of this process, uh, we are transitionally experienced negative growth. If you have negative growth, uh, you have less internal demand uh, and less investment uh, internally also. And so that produces unemployment. Now, the, tr the, the important thing is to study how fast we can uh, restart growing. And uh, we expect uh, by the end of this year, uh, well, by, not by the end of this year, in, in during the 2014, to restart growing, uh, although at a modest uh, pace uh, initially. Uh, but, uh, I mean, we, we really had to, to, 
to face that transitional uh, situation. And of course, this is especially true for the young people, for those who are looking for a first job. Uh, and we are aware of that. And so we are designing policies uh, to see if we can redress those imbalances. It will, it will take some time, but I'm, I feel encouraged by what we have seen so far. I also have two, two sons. I mean, my daughter is 17, my, my son is 18 years old, so uh, I, personally speaking, I feel that uh, I would like to see my country moving to the safe, to, to the safe zone, as it, it has been moving. Uh, the, uh, the sooner, the better, I mean. I'm, hi, I'm Jarrett Lever. I'm a linguistics major and Portuguese minor, and I'm from a suburb of Salt Lake City called Holiday. And my question was, um, Ambassador Brito, how, with the decriminal decriminalization of certain drugs in Portugal that happened more or less 10 years ago. How is the state of Portugal doing now with the results? Like well, well, a very interesting question. Uh, difficult for me because I'm not an expert in that field. What I can tell you is that uh, it's not so much the issue of dec not criminalizing uh, because we don't allow for uh, uh, drugs to, to move freely in Portugal. I mean, uh, uh, there are still there are still crimes uh, linked uh, with the, with those activities, but I think that uh, the policy, the basis was to focus more, not in punishing the people consu the consumers, I mean, uh, so to speak, but in treating them, in getting them back to s to society, and that's uh, why a number of measures uh, have been taken by the government. I believe that we have become a case study. Uh, even in the United States, I get uh, several questions uh, from different states asking uh, about, uh, about that. If you are interested, I can email to you a paper, a uh, very interesting paper in English uh, written by the, the gentleman who was behind this movement in, in, in Portugal, who explains, I mean, uh, in a better way than I can, the results achieved. But I believe that, uh, and I've seen that in the American press as well, uh, mm -hmm. I believe that we have achieved interesting results, so interesting that we, have, we are being studied by a number of countries as a case study. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but the, the light motive was to put less emphasis in, in uh, putting people behind bars, I mean, uh, the people consuming uh, some kinds of drugs, some kinds, not all of them, but uh, putting more emphasis in, in, in taking them back to, to society. Uh, recovering them and, uh, in a way, make, making them more, uh, again, uh, productive uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, so the jury is probably still out, but I think that the results achieved so far, as far as I understand, have been positive. <coughs> My name is Scott McClelland, and I'm from Fresno, California. I'm a Middle East Studies and Arabic major. And uh, you made a brief <coughs> mention towards the Middle East about Morocco being on the footstep of, uh, doorstep of Portugal and also that you have troops in Afghanistan. So my question is, what is the general view or opinion of the Portuguese population towards the Middle East? And does Portugal have the same problems like we do here of Islamophobia and a fear of any Muslim or anyone from the Middle East? I, I will address that uh, your question, but first let me tell you that Fresno is at the heart of the Portuguese-American community in the United States, so uh, I hope that you have some Portuguese-American friends yourself. Uh, and I, I believe that the mem one of the members of Congress is from Fresno, one of the Portuguese Amer uh, men. I'll be there visiting at some point. Uh, so, not skipping your, your question, I mean, no, there is not, I don't think that there is any kind of Islamophobia <laughs> in Portugal. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, what uh, drove us to support NATO as a member of NATO uh, in our operations in Afghanistan is the sense that we are not fighting against Islam. We are fighting terrorism, which is something different. And we are, fi we are fighting a bunch of people who uh, hijacked uh, Islam for their own purposes. So we are not uh, in a crusade. Uh, we, are, we are trying to fight a very uh, tough uh, gang of criminals, uh, of terrorists, 
and uh, in the same process, uh, supporting uh, the stabilization, we hope, of a country that has been at war for too long. So uh, this is not a, a for us um, just uh, staying there forever. I mean, uh, as you know, NATO is moving from uh, a strong military presence to um, uh, an advisory role, a training role uh, in the future. And that's what we want to do. And why is it so important to fight terrorism? Because you have felt the effects of it in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, I, I was living with my family in, in New York when 9-11 happened. So I, I understand uh, uh, how the Americans could feel about terrorism. But it also happened next door in Madrid a few years later. And it could happen ev everywhere. And so I think it's in, if there is an issue about which there is a common interest, is fighting terrorism, fight, fighting international organized crime, uh, including the drugs, uh, illegal the, the tra trafficking in, in illegal drugs. Also the trafficking, illegal trafficking of human beings. It's something that uh, we take uh, very seriously. Uh, and we put a lot of emphasis uh, uh, on that. So, in a nutshell, I mean, uh, there are many interests uh, that move us um, from that point of view, but uh, it's not because we are afraid of Islam. As a matter of fact, we have a very small Islamic community, although we have a very long tra Islamic tradition in Portugal because they, they stayed for about 500 years in the southern part of my country and most of Sp what is Spain today. So there are many things from our cul in our culture that we got from, uh, from their culture, including many words in Portuguese. Mo almost everything starting with an, an A and an L, probably it's linked with, with, this, with, the, with the, the Arab world. Hola, senor embajador. My name is William Johnson. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I am studying business management, um, supply chain, emphasis. I had the opportunity to do a semester abroad in Portugal last year. I was able to live uh, six months in Portugal, and I studied at Ischgte in Lisboa. Oh. And I, it was really a great opportunity. I noticed, um, obviously, with the economic crisis in Europe, I wanted to know, you, you mentioned that your exports were balanced with your trade um, with imports. And I know traditionally Portugal has been in like tile and ceramic and porcelain, cork and wine. And I'm just, I want to know what is Portugal looking forward in, like are they looking to go into new industries and new markets? Or what is Portugal doing to try to stay competitive in the new like world economic uh, situation? You have, uh, well, first of all, let me t uh, congratulate you for your accent, because you are uh, a citizen of Lisbon, uh, as I can detect. Uh, second, I mean, a, a little bit of everything. I mean, we, have, we are exporting more, not because we are, our internal demand uh, is depressed. I mean, that's not a, a result of that. Uh, we are really exporting more, because our, cor our corporations, even our small and, and medium-sized businesses, felt the need to diversify. Uh, I believe that uh, until this crisis started in Europe, uh, which is uh, uh, most of the trade was within Europe. I mean, uh, that, that's not unusual. If you, if you look at your, your trading, trade partners, if you look at the way Canada uh, does its trade uh, with the United States or Mexico, for instance, you see that when there are the integration, uh, more integrated economies, uh, the trend is for those countries to trade more among themselves. So there was no, nothing unusual in that. What we are trying to do is to diversify, to look for new opportunities, like other European countries have been doing. A good example is Germany. The Germans have been uh, acting globally, and uh, if they can do that at a larger scale, how, how can't we do the, something similar at a smaller scale? Uh, so. Um, also, in terms of products, I mean, if you ask me, uh, is there a new product? There are a number of things happening, but uh, there was still room for the, uh, the industries that we had and the services that we provide to diversify more. I said that uh, for the first time we have a, a, a trade balance with, which is balanced since the 30s, if I'm not wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so that means something uh, because 
it is a result not only not only of uh, the a contract a con a diminution of the internal demand, but also uh, a result of the exports, uh, uh, the rising of the, uh, of the Portuguese exports. I have to, to say though that we are exporting more goods uh, and not as much in services uh, as, as we would like to. And we are going to emphasize that uh, in the future as well. But you can address that question also to uh, our the Portuguese trade officer, uh, the, uh, the Portuguese trade representative, I'm sorry, uh, in the United States, uh, who is present uh, here. Hi, uh, I'm Paulo Araujo. I'm an international relations major. I'm from Vitoria, Brazil. Um, and I was just wondering how, uh, being part of the Eurozone, how, how much influence, uh, how hard is it to create inflation and fluctuate prices and how is that <coughs> influencing um, the, is that rest restraining the economic growth in Portugal right now at all or being part of the Eurozone not being able to fluctuate inflation? Mm -hmm. Well, you are from the state of Espírito Santo, right? Yes. Okay. So my geography is still right. Uh, uh, well, uh, there are many ways to deal with a, a crisis like th the one that we are facing. Uh, in the books, no, uh, theoretically. Uh, uh, in practical terms, uh, probably the options are uh, uh, less obvious. Of course, I mean, if a country has its own currency, it can use the currency de by devaluing the currency to, to, to promote uh, some balance uh, in its trade and in, in its accounts, public accounts. But that's not the case. I mean, we are part of a, a larger area. So uh, if, if that happens, you have to decrease uh, to cut in in the, in, the, in the salaries, uh, to cut in the, in the expenditure, uh, the primary expenditure of the country, uh, uh, in order to get that uh, the same, same kind of balance. Uh, because you cannot uh, manipulate the currency uh, from that point of view. But, uh, so, th and that's something that uh, has to be taken by the, all the member states. Now, uh, I think a lot of progress, as I said, has been achieved through this fiscal compact that we have been uh, approving in Europe, through the creations of mechanisms of financial assistance in Europe for the countries uh, which will face difficulties in, 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 in the future. Also, some flexibility has been uh, provided to a number of countries, not only Portugal, but to a number of countries, uh, uh, in, in meeting the targets that they have to meet uh, from from a, a balanced budget point of view, as you know, we can move uh, through. Uh, uh, we cannot have more than three percent, three percent deficit of, uh, of our public accounts from a GDP point of view, uh, theoretically, uh, and it's going to be even lower with the new uh, compact. Um, and so, there are a number of things that have, have been tried. I believe that the intervention of the European Central Bank has been very important also because it, it has calmed down the markets in, in August. Um, and we are cooperating in, in this effort. But ultimately, it's up to each country to face uh, its difficulties. I mean, uh, it's uh, the responsible way of dealing with something difficult if there is a problem is for, the, for, for that country not to blame others but to look at itself and say, well, we are going to do everything that we can do uh, on our own to uh, redress this imbalance. And that's what Portugal has been doing. But that's not enough in a monetary union. We need others to do what they should do also in order to, get this, uh, to correct these imbalances. Well, thank you.